biggest unsolved mystery in each U.S. state, and a lot of people really liked it and wanted more unsolved mystery videos, so this one is just going to be the 50 biggest unsolved mysteries. Um, so yeah, it's going to be like international all around the world, so hopefully this is interesting. Um, yeah, maybe you're from a country where one of these occurred, so let me know if, like, you know any more information about it, but yeah, I hope you enjoy, so let's get started. Number one is the body on Somerton Beach. In December 1948, a body was found on Somerton Beach in Adelaide, Australia. The body was a man who was dressed impeccably in a suit with polished shoes, and his head was slumped against a wall. Authorities thought the case of death was heart failure, or more likely poisoning. However, during the autopsy, no trace of poison was found. There wasn't a wallet or any type of identification on the man, and all the tags in his clothing were cut out. The fingerprints the authorities took from him were also unidentifiable. They even put a photo of the body in the newspapers, and still, no one could identify the man. Four months later, after the body was found, detectives found a hidden pocket that was sewn on the inside of his trousers. Inside the pocket was a rolled up piece of paper from a rare book. The piece of paper had the words, Tamam Shud, on it, which means it has ended. After months of looking for the exact book, authorities decided to bury the man without identification. Although a cast was taken of the bust and he was embalmed to preserve him. Eight months later, a man walked into the police station. He claimed that just after the body was found, he found a copy of the exact book in the back of his car that he kept parked near Somerton Beach. He thought nothing of it until he read about the search in a newspaper article. Sure enough, the book had a part of the final page that was torn, and it matched the piece of paper that was found in the man's trousers. Inside the book were a phone number and some sort of strange code. The phone number led authorities to a woman named Jessica, who lived nearby. During her interview, she was very evasive and even claimed she was going to faint when she saw the bust of the Somerton man, but denied knowing him. However, she said she did sell the book to a man named Alfred Boxall. Unfortunately, Alfred was still very much alive at the time and still had the copy of the book that Jessica had sold him. The code that was found ended up being even more unhelpful, and as of today, it has still yet to be cracked. To this day, the man is still unidentified. Wow, I feel like I've heard of that case in general, but I don't think I knew any of those details. Um, wow. Also, probably not going to do all 50 if they're all that long, because that could be a very long video, but we'll see. Number two. The Strange Disappearance of D.B. Cooper On Wednesday, November 24th, 1971, a man identified as Daniel Cooper bought a $20 one-way ticket on Northwest Airlines on Flight 305 from Portland, Oregon to Seattle, Washington. Cooper was described as being in his mid-forties, wearing a business suit, an overcoat, brown shoes, a white shirt, and a black tie. He also carried a briefcase and a brown paper bag. Before the flight took off, he ordered a bourbon 
soda from a flight attendant. After the plane was airborne, Cooper handed the flight attendant a note. At first, she put it in her pocket without looking at it, but then Cooper told her, Miss, you better look at that note. I have a bomb. Cooper then told her the bomb was in his briefcase and asked her to sit next to him. He opened the briefcase to reveal red-colored sticks surrounded by an array of wires. Cooper then told the flight attendant to write down everything he was saying and then take it to the captain. The note said, I want $200,000 by 5 p.m. in cash, exclusively in $20 bills, put in a knapsack. I want two back parachutes and two front parachutes. When we land, I want a fuel truck ready to refuel. No funny stuff or I'll do the job. FBI agents assembled the ransom money from several Seattle area banks and Seattle police obtained the parachutes from a local skydiving school. When Cooper claimed his demands were met, he allowed all passengers and some of the crew to exit the airplane. Cooper told the remaining crew to refuel the plane and chart a course for Mexico City while staying below 10,000 feet. During the flight, Cooper put on a pair of dark wraparound sunglasses, which would make it into the official sketch and become famous with anyone investigating the case. A little after 8 p.m. and somewhere in between Seattle and Reno, Nevada, Cooper jumped out of the rear door of the plane with two of the parachutes and the money. He was never seen again. Despite an expansive manhunt, and over 45 years of searching. No conclusions have been made to the man's identity or his fate after he jumped. It is called one of the greatest cold cases in FBI and U.S. history. I don't think I've ever heard that one. That is crazy. Wow. I feel like they could have found him. I mean, there had to have been a man spending a bunch of money somewhere. Like he must have died or else, I don't know. Okay. Number three, the Black Dahlia murder. On January 15th, 1947, the remains of 22 year old Elizabeth Short, AKA the Black Dahlia, were found on the block of 3800S Norton Avenue in Los Angeles, California. South Norton Avenue. That's, I'm just like reading directly. The body was cut in half and so pale and drained of blood that the woman who found the body mistook it for a mannequin at first. The body was cut with surgical precision, leaving no trauma to internal organs and bones. Her face was also cut from mouth to ears, leaving an eerie, permanent smile. There was no blood on the ground, making it believed that the body was moved after she had been murdered. Nine days after she was discovered, an envelope was sent to the examiner addressed by using individual cut and pasted letters from magazines and newspapers. It read, the Los Angeles Examiner and other Los Angeles papers. Here is Dahlia's belongings. Letter to follow. As promised, the envelope contained Short's social security card, birth certificate, photographs, names written on pieces of paper, and an address book with pages missing, and the name Mark Hansen embossed on the cover. Gasoline was 
is used to clean the objects, removing the fingerprints. On March 14th, a suicide note scrawled in pencil on a bit of paper was found tucked in a shoe in a pile of men's clothing by the ocean's edge at the foot of Breeze Avenue in Venice. The note read, To whom it may concern, I have waited for the police to capture me for the Black Dahlia killing, but have not. I am too much of a coward to turn myself in, so this is the best way out for me. I couldn't help myself for that or this. Sorry, Mary. The pile of clothing was first seen by the beach caretaker, who reported the discovery to the lifeguard captain, John Dillon. Dillon immediately notified the West Los Angeles police station. The clothes included a coat and trousers of blue herringbone tweed, a brown and white shirt, white jockey shorts, tan socks, and tan moccasin shoes about size 8. However, the clothes gave no clue about the identity of their owner. Although many suspects were named, no authorities were able to identify the Black Dahlia's killer, and the mystery has gone unsolved for over 70 years. Wow. These are like, yeah, very creepy. I feel like the last video was really um, kind of like weird phenomena, but these are all like murders, so. Number four. Also, sorry, a lot of these are still U.S.-centered, so hopefully there will be non-U.S. ones. Wall Street bombing of 1920. During the lunch rush on Wall Street on a September day in 1920, a nondescript man driving a cart pressed an old horse forward in front of the U.S. Assay office, across from the J.P. Morgan building. He stopped his cart, got down, and immediately disappeared into the crowd. Minutes later, the cart exploded into a hail of metal fragments, immediately killing more than 30 people and injuring 300. The aftermath was horrific, and the death toll kept rising as the day wore on, and more victims succumbed to their injuries. In the beginning, it wasn't obvious that the explosion was an intentional act of terrorism. It was viewed as simply an accident. Maintenance crews cleaned up the damage overnight, plus throwing away any physical evidence would be crucial to identifying the perpetrator. By the next morning, Wall Street was back in business. Conspiracy theories were abundant, but the New York police and fire departments, the Bureau of Investigation, and the U.S. Secret Service were on the job to find out the truth. Each lead was actively pursued, and the Bureau interviewed hundreds of people who had been around that area before, during, and after the attack, but collected very little information. The few recollections of the driver and wagon were vague and useless. The NYPD was able to reconstruct the bomb and its fuse mechanism, but there was much debate about the nature of the explosive. However, the most promising lead had actually come prior to the explosion. A mailman had found four crudely spelled and printed flyers in the Wall Street area from a group calling itself the American Anarchist Fighters that demanded the release of political prisoners. The letters seemed similar to ones used the previous year in two bombing campaigns, which were led by Italian anarchists. 
Bureau investigated up and down the East Coast to trace the printing of these flyers, but they were unsuccessful. Based on the bomb attacks over the previous decade, the Bureau initially suspected followers of the Italian anarchist Luigi Galliani had committed the crime, but the case couldn't be proved and Galliani had already fled the country. Over the next three years, hot leads turned cold and promising trails turned into dead ends. In the end, the bombers were not identified. Alrighty then. Number five, the disturbing death of Elisa Lamb. Oh, I think I know this one. I think I've heard this one. On January 26th, 2013, 21 year old Canadian tourist Elisa Lamb checked into the Cecil Hotel in downtown Los Angeles. When she never checked out on February 1st, nor had any contact with her parents, the Los Angeles Police Department was contacted. On February 19th, 18 days from the last time she was seen, her body was found floating in a water tank on the roof of the Cecil Hotel. Her body was found due to hotel guests complaining about the hotel's water pressure. One couple even reported that the water was coming out black and had a bad taste. According to the hotel's manager, when Elisa Lamb had checked in, she was staying at a hostel-style room with other travelers, but later was moved to her own room due to complaints from her roommates about odd behavior. The last time she was seen on surveillance footage on the hotel's elevator, the footage showed her acting strange and peculiar, almost like she was hiding. She also moved her hands in weird and inhumane ways, and it looked like she was talking to someone who was out of the security camera's view. After her body and the footage were found, it was suggested she was on some sort of hallucinogenic drug. Even though Lamb took four different medications for her bipolar disorder, Toxicology studies reported that there were no traces of any drugs or alcohol that could have contributed to her death. There was also a theory that she was murdered and died as a result of drowning, but the autopsy report showed no evidence of trauma. To this day, no one knows how she was able to access the roof or climb into the water tank and shut the 20-pound lid by herself. Yeah, I've heard of that one, and it's crazy because it's like, there's no way she could have gotten into it and shut the lid by herself, but then also, like, how could somebody get, like, a living woman into that tank and shut the lid? I don't know. Crazy. Number six, Jack the Ripper. In 1888, in foggy, dark streets of the East End of London, better known as the Whitechapel District, lived a serial killer that would go down in history as Jack the Ripper. Even though the Whitechapel District was known for its violence and crime, the string of murders conducted by Jack the Ripper would terrorize the public like no one had seen before. He was described as a madman with no clear motive, even though his most famous murders only included five women. Many theories suggest that he claimed the lives of up to 11 women. All of the victims of the canonical five were prostitutes, as it was common for women who lived in the 
Whitechapel district to take on as a means to survive. All five killings took place within a mile of each other from August 7th to September 10th, 1888. Several other murders occurring around that time period have also been investigated as the work of a lef- leather apron, another name given to the killer. A number of letters were a re- allegedly sent by the killer to the London Metropolitan Police Service, taunting officers about his gruesome activities and speculating on murders to come. The name Jack the Ripper originates from a letter which is famously known now as the From Hell Letter that was published at the time of the attacks. Despite countless investigations claiming definitive evidence of the brutal killer's identity, their true name and motive are still unknown. I'm going to be honest, I've always heard of Jack the Ripper and I thought that it was like a solved thing. I thought it was an actual person. I didn't know that that was like a mystery. Okay, anyway. Number seven is the Zodiac Killer. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, a serial killer known as the Zodiac Killer terrorized Northern California. There were at least five victims, but later on, the murderer would claim he killed at least 37 people in total. On December 20th, 1968, on Lake Herman Road in Vallejo, 17-year-old David Faraday and 16-year-old Betty Lou Jensen were shot and killed while sitting in a parked car in a gravel parking area. By the time police arrived, Betty was found dead, but David was still alive. Unfortunately, he died on the way to the hospital. This was the first murder that the Zodiac killer conducted and got away with. The Zodiac's next crime would happen on July 4th, 1969, in Blue Rock Springs Park, only a few minutes away from the previous crime. The Zodiac killer approached a car with a flashlight and then murdered 22-year-old Darlene Farron and 19-year-old Michael Mago, Maggio. Both were still alive when found, but only Maggio would survive. He was able to describe the shooter as a young white male, 26 to 30 years old, a stocky build, 200 pounds or larger, about 5'8", with a light brown curly hair and a large face. Within an hour, the police received a phone call from someone who claimed to be the shooter, and the shooter in the Lake Herman Road murders. On August 1st, 1969, the San Francisco Chronicle, the San Francisco Examiner, and the Vallejo Herald all received a handwritten letter by someone who claimed to be the shooter. The letters revealed specific details about the killings to prove that the writer was indeed the murderer. All the letters were signed with a circle with a cross through it, the symbol that would eventually be known as the mark of the Zodiac Killer. Also included in the letter were three different codes that the Zodiac Killer demanded to be printed in newspapers or else he would kill again. The Zodiac Killer said that the cracked codes would reveal his identity. On August 4th, another letter was received that started with the phrase saying, This is the Zodiac speaking, marking the first time the killer referred to himself as the Zodiac. On August 8th, the code was cracked by a couple in Salinas, California. The codes read, I like killing because it is so much fun. It is more fun than killing wild game in the forest, because man 
is the most dangerous animal of all to kill. Something gives me the most thrilling experience. It is even better than getting your rocks off with a girl. The best part of it is that when I die, I will be reborn in paradise, and those I have killed will become my slaves. I will not give you my name because you will slow down or stop my collecting of slaves for the afterlife. After claiming three more lives and causing nationwide terror, the Zodiac Killer wrote his final letter on January 29th, 1974, concluding the letter with a new score. Me, 37. San Francisco Police Department, zero. The true identity of the killer has never been found. I've heard of that one, but I didn't know all the details. Wow. So I guess the murders stopped, but we never found. I don't know. Number eight. This is a good one. The case of John Benet Ramsey. On December 26th, 1996, in Boulder, Colorado, Patsy Ramsey claimed to have discovered a ransom note for her six-year-old daughter, John Benet Ramsey, on the back staircase inside the Ramsey home. This prompted her to call the police at 5.52 a.m. to report her daughter missing. The only people in the house were John Ramsey, her father, Patsy, her mother, and her brother, Burke. Oddly enough, John Benet's body was found inside the home in the utility room in the basement less than eight hours later. The body was found by John, and duct tape was found across her mouth and a smooth cord around her neck. When police arrived, it was suspected that the crime scene was heavily compromised due to multiple people arriving at the scene. The police had also claimed that they had not searched the house after Patsy's initial call because there was no reason to believe that John Benet was in the house. At the time of her death, John Benet was known as a child beauty queen superstar having won at least five high-end child beauty competitions. Her death was ultimately ruled a homicide. The autopsy stated that John Benet's official cause of death was asphyxia by strangulation associated with craniocerebral trauma due, sorry, due to John Benet's beauty queen popularity and her mother being a former beauty queen, the case caused nationwide and media interest. Today, the crime is still unsolved and remains an open investigation with the Boulder Police Department. I know I still like frequently hear like, oh, we have new evidence. I know a lot of people think that it was her brother that did it. Number nine, the unsolved, I'm going to mispronounce this, Hinterkaifeck murders. On the evening of March 31st, 1922, on Hinterkaifeck Farm in Bavaria, Germany, six residents were murdered with a pickaxe. The victims included husband and wife, Andreas and Kazila Gruber, their widowed daughter, Victoria Gabriel, Victoria's children, Kazila and Joseph, and the family's maid, Maria Baumgartner. Two-year-old Joseph was killed in his crib, and Maria was killed in her bed, while the rest of the family was then murdered in the barn and stacked on top of each other. Upon the discovery, authorities concluded that the murder actually lived on the farm 
for six days after they committed the crime. Even after the family had died, cattle were still being fed. Meals were being eaten in the kitchen. Neighbors reported seeing smoke rising from the chimney, and the family dog was tied up to a post when the mailman came on Saturday. The bodies were discovered the next day. What makes this crime even more chilling was that Maria was actually hired the same day she was killed, replacing the previous maid who had quit six months earlier due to the house being haunted. She reported to the family of hearing footsteps in the attic and voices. Around the time the previous maid had quit, the Gruber family had also begun to hear voices from the attic. Andreas had also noticed a set of house keys had gone missing. An unfamiliar newspaper in the house that he had never seen before, plus scratches on the family's tool shed, like someone had tried to pick the lock. He had also reported seeing a pair of unfamiliar footsteps leading from the woods towards the back entrance of the family's home. Despite repeated arrests, no murderer has ever been found, and the files were closed in 1955, and the house was demolished. So we're just not gonna, like, look into that? I don't know. Man, that's crazy. It was definitely like an inside job. Okay, number 10. And I think I'll probably stop here. I, there's no way I can do all 50 of these, but... The Ghost Ship of the Mary Celeste On December 4th, 1872, a British-American ship called the Mary Celeste was found abandoned and floating in the Atlantic Ocean. It was found to be perfectly seaworthy and with its cargo fully intact except for a lifeboat, which it appeared had been boarded in an orderly fashion. But why? We may never know, because no one was on board was ever heard from again. The Mary Celeste set sail from New York, bound for Genoa, Italy, in November 1872. The ship was manned by Captain Benjamin Briggs, and seven crew members, including Briggs' wife and their two-year-old daughter. Supplies on board were set to last for six months, and there were luxurious items on board, including a sewing machine and an upright piano. Historians and commentators generally agree that to abandon such a worthy ship, some extraordinary and alarming circumstance must have arisen. However, the last entry on the ship's daily log reveals nothing unusual, and inside the ship all appeared to be in order. Conspiracy theories over the years have included mutiny, pirate attack, and even a giant octopus or sea monster attack. However, the cause behind this ghost ship remains unsolved. Wait, so did... Did the family die, or were they the ones that escaped? I don't know. I don't, I don't know if, it, if they died or they escaped, but... Oh well. Um, anyway, I think I'll stop there with ten... Um, I'll definitely, like, do a part two or a part three of this video, um, because this article is really interesting. It's just, they're very long, and I already filmed a video today, so, like, my throat hurts, and I'm tired of talking. Um, but yeah, I hope you enjoyed these ten unsolved mysteries. Um, these were very, like, true crime-ish, um, a lot different from the other unsolved mysteries I did, but 
Either way, I hope you enjoyed it and let me know if you want to see a part two of this article because it was very interesting. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed and I will see you in my next video. So sleep well and